sixth reason. One trait of liberal Christianity is the rejection of the infallibility of the Bible and call for us to find a canon within a canon. A canon within a canon. In other words, this is the canon, the Protestant canon, the 66 books closed. You don't add anything to it. And liberalism says, you can't believe all of this. There's some of this that is simply unbelievable, mythological, and what you find is within the canon, a canon, and, and different liberals have different canons within the canon to judge what you can accept and what you can't accept, like love or brotherhood of man or fatherhood of God, things like that. I went to a seminar with Ernst Kesemann. He was one of the big German scholars in the 50s and 60s and 70s, lived to be a very old man, and he wrote this, which is typical of radical, liberal, New Testament scholarship. The scripture which one gives over to itself and to which one gives himself up uncritically without the principal key leads not only to a multiplicity of confessions, but also to the inability to distinguish between faith and superstition, the father of Jesus Christ and the idol. In other words, if you give yourself wholly to the Bible as a whole, without making distinctions in it, you will wind up in a situation where you can't distinguish faith from superstition. Does the New Testament canon establish the unity of the church? No. It, the canon, establishes also a variety of Christologies which are in part incompatible. The canon as such also legitimates more or less all sects and false doctrines. What he's saying very simply is this book, this New Testament, if you take it as it is, without making distinctions of what you can accept and what you can't, what you have is a book that gives warrant to all sects, all heresies, all Christologies, because they're all here. And they contradict each other. So this is not the ground of the unity of the church. It's the ground of the disunity of the church as we find it. And the only way to handle a book that grounds disunity is to accept some parts of it and not other parts. That's Ernst Kesemann, that's liberalism right across the board. I had lunch, there's a pastor in the city here, there's lots of them, but I, I was especially bent out of shape by one because of a sermon of his on the web. And I called him up and I asked him if we could do lunch. This guy is the most liberal pastor probably in the state of Minnesota. Uh, at least that's what he would claim. <laughs> um, and so we went to Baker Square over by the university, and uh, I wanted to meet a real, live, radical liberal who, who called himself a Christian and didn't believe anything I believed. And there he was sitting across the table, and, uh, and I began to just ask him questions. Heaven, hell, deity of Christ, inspiration of the Bible, no, no, no. And, and I, I gave him a text in particular from Acts 13, 48, as many as were foreordained to eternal life believed, as many were, and said, it seems to me that some Jews believed and some Jews didn't, and the implication is some are lost and some are saved. He got really upset because he was arguing that everybody's saved, go the Jewish way, go the Muslim way, go the Christian way. We have our Christian way. We should stay to it, be faithful to it, but others are okay. And I said, I just, I, finally I just kind of threw up my hand and said, I just don't see how you can call yourself a Christian. <laughs> you don't say that to one of the most prominent pastors in the Twin Cities. Big church downtown. You don't have to guess which one it is. He's still here. And, and he got very upset with me. Very upset. He said, well, I'm, I'm very offended by that. I said, well, I would assume you are. But I, just, I just can't believe it. So I, I, there was my experience, and, and uh, that was that. So I'm not, I'm not just, you know, quoting Kesemann from faraway Germany 30 years ago. This, this is Mr. Blank 
I forget when that meal was, two, three years ago that we did that, and he's still there. I mean, our city has dozens of pastors who, are, who would just as soon take their text on a Sunday morning from an American poet as from the scriptures. In fact, he told me over that meal, my people are on my case to take more Sunday morning texts from, and I wish I could remember the specific poet, who, who, who's one of the most famous, you, you'll know this, who's one of the most famous American woman poets who wrote little short poems? What? No. Emily Dickinson. That's right, Emily Dickinson. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> one of them. That's close enough. And, and, and he said, but I usually take my text from the Bible. I said, well, that's good. I'm glad you do. <laughs> it's very sad and very real. Uh, here we are. I, I wrote this today. This is not old. This is because stuff's happening all the time. Um, in every generation, we're still on number six, there are new creative attacks on the trustworthiness of the Bible. In our day, Bart Ehrman leads the pack in trying to discredit the reliability of, of the biblical text. His, his claim is that the New Testament has been corrupted by copyists so badly it can't be recovered. His newest book here, 2007, Misquoting Jesus, the story behind who changed the Bible and why. A couple of other of his books here. Uh, Ehrman and others, as you know, with uh, the Gospels that are popping out here and there uh, have also argued that there are other Gospels beside our own that show alternative Christianities that are as valid as the traditional one. So the, the lost Gospel of Judas Iscariot and um, Elaine Padgel's Beyond Belief, the Secret Gospel of Thomas. And I'll just p point you right here. This is a brand new response by Daryl Bach, uh, dethroning Jesus, exposing popular culture's quest to unseat the biblical Christ. So if you want a, 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 a right off the front burner, careful, scholarly, yet readable uh, response to the Bart Ehrman type attacks, then go to Daryl Bach, dethroning Jesus. So very relevant, very up to date. Um, I have other if you want to look at these uh, at any time, I've got a list of books on the reliability of the New Testament of a more contemporary kind and, and responses to Ehrman here. I won't, I won't go into those, but I will set them aside here. In fact, let me take this point to just draw your attention to a couple of books or to, to a certain kind of book. You, you may not know that such books exist. They, they prove to be very, very helpful. If, if you regularly get questions from people, family members or work associates, poking at a problem in the Bible that they've spotted or somebody mentioned on the radio, these kinds of books can be helpful. They're not the kind of book you just sit down and read through. This is called When Critics Ask by, by Geisler and Howe, a popular handbook of Bible difficulties. So uh, over a lifetime of trying to wrestle through difficulties in the Bible, he's put a, answers in here, and then here's, here's an older one. This is 92, this is 82. There may be something more contemporary than these that I've missed, but Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties by Gleason Archer. So those kinds of books are out there uh, for your help. By the way, another methodological comment here just to help you survive um, I am keenly aware that after five hours of talking, you will remember almost nothing of what I say. And that's the case with almost all elaborate argumentation for a true point, which means, bottom line, that your deep confidence in the Word of God cannot rest on your memory of historical argumentation because your memory won't work like that. And in the moment of trial, either somebody attacking you or cancer being announced by the doctor, that memory will not work. You can't reconstruct five hours of elaborate argumentation for your confidence in the Bible. It won't work. The mind won't do it. So where do you rest? That, I'm aware of that, so by the time we're done, Lord willing, tomorrow, I will have 
um, honored that reality in the way I answered the question of your confidence. I just want you to know ahead of time, I'm not expecting you, if I lay these one after the other, you say, oh, I can't remember that, I can't even understand that, I, and you're losing your balance, you say, my faith is going to be as fragile as all this information I can't remember. I hope not. So hold on and stay with me, and I will try to show you how I live in the real world as a believer in the Bible when in fact I can't even remember my own best arguments. That's true. I'm 62, I've worked on this a long time and I've forgotten most of what I've studied. I have to refresh every time I teach this course and say, what good is that? You gotta refresh. Well, that's just life. You just got, we gotta figure that out because that's where almost every human being is, and most of the people in the world who are being preached to right now don't even have a grade school education. And we expect them to die for Jesus, confident that the Bible is true. We better have another way for them to have warranted faith than to be able to reproduce all this stuff. Okay? I'm aware of that, and I uh, just want you to know I'm, I'm where you are Number seven as to why we're doing this. If it is true, if the book is true, big if at this point, if it is true, uh, the message of the Bible is the only message of eternal life because it says it is. If it's not true, it may not be. But if it is true, then it is. For example, Psalm 95, 96, verse 5 for all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. All of them are idols. That's a sweeping statement. John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. John 6, 67, Jesus said, therefore, to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. John 8.42, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and have come from God. You don't love me, you don't know God. You don't love God. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. 1 John 5, 12. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. This is a, this is a sweeping rejection of all other religions. This is an intolerable thing to say in public in Minneapolis. They have really ugly names for people that believe this. Luke 10, 16. The one who hears you hears me. The one who rejects you, this is Jesus talking, rejects me. And the one who rejects me Jesus says, rejects him who sent me. If you reject Jesus for who he is, you can't create him in your own image and say, oh, I believe in Jesus as a teacher. That's not what he means. Like, accept me on your terms. No, accept me for who I am, then you accept the Father. You reject me for who I am, you reject the Father. Jesus Christ is the litmus paper that you put in the chemical of every religion. If when you put Jesus Christ in the chemical of that religion, they say, I don't believe, they don't know God. That's big. That's really big. And so we need to know, am I going to stake my reputation on this and be called an absolutely foul-mouthed, fundamentalist, obscurantist, intolerant, obscene, Pastor, those are all words that have been used of me in the newspaper or in personal letters from those pastors in this city. 
Well, you decide. Here's number eight for why we are taking this up. Building our lives of sacrificial service on a mistake would be pitiable. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, in other words, if, if the resurrection is a myth and a sham, we are of all men most to be pitied. What fools we are. What absolute fools we are to embrace this, build our lives on it, make sacrifices for it, structure our whole existence around it. What a foolish thing. Unless it's true. Number nine, the Bible makes claims to inspiration and authority and inerrancy. We have to come to terms with those. For example, 2 Timothy 3.15, from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So there's the claim. All Scripture, we'll talk about what is contained there. All Scripture is inspired by God, and therefore it's profitable. One last reason for why we're doing this. Yet, the most devout believers meet Scriptures that do not seem coherent with other parts or with our experience. And here are just a few. The problem of justification by faith in James and Paul. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone, James 2.24, Romans 2.3.28. We maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And you can imagine coming to the Bible and just being presented with those two statements saying, <laughs> this Bible is not coherent. You have to reckon with that. I mean, there are numerous things like that in the Bible. And the question is whether or not those words are used the same by James and the same by Paul in such a way that they are constructing two different views of reality or not. It is possible to say very different things and not have a meaning behind them that is contradictory. That's possible. Or, 1 Samuel 15, 11, the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I repent that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me. 1 Samuel 15, 28, 29, so you have God repenting. I repent. And here, this is, what is this? 17 verses later. The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or repent, for he's not a man that he should repent. Now that's a little more comforting because the verses are only 17 verses apart which means you have the same author saying in one verse, God repented that he made Saul king, and 17 verses later saying God never repents. So either he is really, really quickly confused, or he has meanings in mind here that are not contradictory, and you have to figure out what's going on. So that's a tenth reason for why we need to be confident in the word, because you're going to bump into these kinds of things in your daily devotions pretty regularly. And the longer you live and walk with the Lord, I believe the more confident you become and the more solutions you can find. And sometimes you need to suspend judgment and say, I don't have time to work on this, Lord. <laughs> I'd like to have an answer for what this means and how it fits with that over there. And then you put it on a shelf or keep a list. And as God gives you occasion, you, you work. But my guess is we will go to our grave with some of those on the list unresolved. You love anybody that you can't understand? Like Noel Piper? Baffles me over and over again. 
What makes you tick, Noel? I can't figure you out. But my, I love you. I'm going nowhere. But with you, perplexing as you are as a human being, if you can do it with a wife, you can do it with the Bible. The Bible's got a lot more going for it than Noel does. And she wouldn't be offended by that statement. That's why I like her. 